Well, thank you all so much. Uh, it is such a pleasure and a really an honor to be able to be your closer. I, uh, when we first learned that uh, this symposium was going to be in Washington, D.C., uh, we took it, we just wanted to, as Gary said, we wanted to make this one a special uh, symposium. So my thanks to uh, all of my Department of Defense colleagues who came in. Some of you made this a training event uh, for, for the week. Uh, some of you have made this an organizational gathering event. Some of you have really taken advantage of this event, like I love to do, to um, create some of these new products contribute to the development and um, of the methodologies that we know uh, that we need to face the challenges and the opportunities to transform systems engineering. So thank you to my DOD family. And I also wanted to say thank you to my other government agency uh, partners. We reached out uh, across the board, uh, Homeland Security and NASA, FAA, Department of Transportation. We had a wonderful panel earlier this week. Uh, many of you were able to, to join them up there. And I just want to thank all of my government partners on behalf of the nation's capital that uh, I hope that we have really uh, been made, a, made this uh, be wonderful hosts for the Nkozi family. So today what I'm going to do for you is share with you a little bit about systems engineering in the department, uh, where we, where, why it is critical and why it continues to be uh, a critical aspect. And I'm going to leave with some challenges for us. I like to always take advantage of opportunities when I speak to groups to, to give us, you know, some, some things to think about, some challenges that still remain, and, and uh, hope that um, this community can, can really help us to, to solve them. I think as many of you have all said, this is really a, a community opportunity. We all employ systems engineering. We all require it. It's critical depending, it doesn't matter if you're a government organization, an industry, an organization, academic, if you're a uh, public service or if you're uh, private equity. You, uh, you uh, practice systems engineering and I think this community will continue to be uh, absolutely critical. So the Department of Defense uh, has long been a uh, strategic uh, innovation uh, delivery uh, uh, mechanism. So we've had a lot of investments, as you well know, in uh, research and development. And I just wanted to share a couple with you. I think it's, you know, we know, we've heard about uh, perhaps the, the internet uh, and, uh, and maybe even the microwave. Uh, we've heard about GPS. But had you known about um, the XSTAT, which is a, uh, a capability to help stop, uh, quick capability for medical attention to help stop bleeding on the battlefield. Now it's used uh, today by our first responders. Uh, duct tape, uh, super glue, one of my favorite uh, things. I'm not much of a, of a sewer. Uh, when I get a rip in something, I, I have safety pins uh, uh, and, and super glue. I like to just, you know, uh, tack things together with super glue. So very, very important. Thanks to the, uh, the Department of Defense for that. Digital, uh, digital photography and EpiPens, uh, really fantastic. So, um, you know, today um, we, need, we know that we need to continue this innovation. You, you've all heard in the past administration and then through, carrying through to today's, there's a, there's a strategic focus by the Department of Defense to, um, to reach out to non-traditional partners, to our uh, global partners, academic partners, and continue this spirit of innovation because it has been so critical uh, to, our, to our continued capability to carry out our mission. So earlier this year, our new Secretary of Defense, Secretary uh, James Mattis, uh, released his National Defense Strategy. Uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And what I love about it is there's a hook in there for engineering. It makes us important. We carry out a critical role for the, uh, for the national defense. Uh, he, in this, in this uh, defense strategy, he recognizes technology, as I said before, as a critical element. We talk about, uh, and many of you will be familiar about, you know, discussing the, the different types of capabilities that we're trying to deliver in order to carry out the mission of uh, defending the nation. Uh, we talk about being contested in land, in air, in sea, and in space. And we want to deliver good, cap strong capabilities, advanced technology capabilities for our warfighter, uh, even in cyber, perhaps the, the fifth contested area, if you will. But Secretary Mattis, he talks about a sixth 
contested area, and that's technology. Technology today is global. There's a lot of access to uh, innovation and technology. Um, it used to be historically, uh, or you know, if you look back decades, the investment in technology was probably two thirds by government organizations. M government countries would make those uh, research and uh, technology investments and carried, you know, the majority of the funding for them. Today, that's flipped around. We know uh, commercial technology investments, um, uh, you know, they're, they're on the two-thirds side, whereas uh, government investment catching up and augmenting that with the, with the remaining one-third. So this is a paradigm shift, and we need, to, um, we need to reach out to these new partners and take advantage of technology in different ways, and we need to engineer and adopt that technology. So Secretary Mattis's three priorities for the department are, number one, to continue to build our force a lethal force. He talks about it like that because he wants to call attention to the mission of uh, preserving our nation's security, but his definition of lethality is a systems definition. He talks about it in terms of the equipment that we deliver, the, the soldiers or sailors or airmen, marines that operate that equipment. He talks about the supply chain. He talks about the, um, the families the, and the health uh, and the community of our of our Department of Defense family. And so it's very much a broad systems definition, and so there's a lot of opportunities for the department and our community to contribute to his number one priority. Priority number two, strengthening and attracting brand new uh, alliances and partnerships. Again, this is a global activity, and a quote from his from his uh, strategy to continue to work with our allies to reinforce the safety and security that underpins the peace and economic prosperity for all nations, his number two priority. And I feel like we've been doing that here this week. I feel like we do that continuously in this community. I love the diversity focus that you all are having. I think that's wonderful, and it was, a, it was, a awesome, it was an honor to be able to uh, participate in the Women's Leadership Forum last Saturday. Thank you to Alice Squires and, and the team that pulled that together. It really was uh, a very enjoyable experience. Our number three priority from the Secretary is to institute business reforms into the department to allow us to be um, more efficient, cost-effective with the taxpayer dollar allow us to ad adopt that innovation and skill. And I think that systems engineering, as you well know, contributes greatly to efficiencies and affordability, and it's a, it's a real opportunity for us, again, to contribute to the national defense strategy. Future, so how we're talking about, what, what is it that we're trying to deliver, and where is this, all this technology going? If you just take a look, and this is just a snapshot, one person's idea of what the future in warfighting systems might really look like. We've got things like systems of systems where constituents may join and exit a, a mission or an operation, uh, collaborating and then, and then leaving, um, not necessarily owning that mission, but contributing to that mission in new and different ways. We have uh, integration with commercial, social networking technologies and opportunities to leverage uh, uh, social media and commercial um, activities along with uh, and integrated with uh, the battle space. We have uh, man-machine teaming activities, in many cases in, s in, in dense urban environments, collaborating with um, autonomous technologies, with those commercial social networks, and uh, individual agile uh, soldier teams. We have miniaturized sensor technologies that are that perhaps could uh, swarm and share behaviors uh, and commands um, as as well as of course communicating back with uh, major system platforms we have undersea capabilities that launch uh, kinetic and non kinetic uh, ac uh, capabilities as well these warfighting capabilities that we're portraying they rely upon government and commercial technology as I've discussed uh, and the development, the co-development of those types of technologies and the systems integration of those technologies. We have a long list of legacy platforms 
in the Department of Defense. As you well know, we have long life cycles. So it's a real challenge to think about how do I do this innovation? How do I insert technology and refresh? How do I adapt the way that my systems might perform with new opportunities, but as well as retain my, my current legacy uh, system capabilities, know when to uh, 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 transition them end life cycle, and know that when, I, when we can be confident in introducing brand new capabilities that can deliver the same mission, but perhaps with uh, through different means. At the same time, we have a focus on critical technology areas, and these technologies are driving uh, uh, not just DOD, not just military and aerospace and defense, not just nations and international defense, but these technologies that we seek are shared and coveted by commercial uh, sector applications, by other um, critical infrastructure sectors. They include things that we've talked about this week, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, protected communications. Our privacy is important to, to um, many different industries and applications. We talk about um, advanced sensing capabilities, directed energy, and microelectronics. Advanced computing technology underpins probably every one of these warfighting capabilities that are envisioned. Uh, a lot of the innovation capabilities that we seek in hardware, we talk a lot about software. I'm so pleased that Incozy has also taken a look in the future about the integration of software and hardware and systems. We can't get away from it. We've known that for years now, and it's, it's, it's really a good opportunity to have a continued focus on software. But hardware, microelectronics, advanced computing technology, really, really critical, and a, and a strong focus for, for, uh, for the department. So back to why this is important to engineers. Why are we here? Why, do we, why am I talking to you about all this? I'm talking to you about it because um, it's all about modernization. So the secretary talks about, at least for D DOD, we want to modernize our key capabilities. We want to make investments in space and cyberspace, uh, nuclear deterrence, missile defense, advanced autonomous systems. And so what we're doing right now is we're developing sort of roadmaps, capability roadmaps. What are the opportunities on the technology side and how can we deliver some of those um, opportunities, uh, transition those opportunities into capabilities over the next 10 years or so in, in time phased increments. What, that, what you have to really do in order to realize capabilities is you have to then, you have to link those into operational um, scenarios, into concept of operations, concepts that our, that our military departments, our warfighters can employ. And then that derives up, or derives down, you know, up to the, the our, our department's uh, strate strategy. And so that, that whole notion of being able to understand where I want to go and how it can be employed through this mission perspective, systems of systems for this community, we think about it as a, as a mission outcome, all about really a systems engineering approach, understanding what the opportunities are, what your requirements are, and mapping them together. So engineers are very much involved in this. Um, also, then, once you've got that roadmap, what do you, we need to we need to decompose that that capability plan into what are the technology programs, the systems in that are that are imagined, the the legacy systems, that baseline that I mentioned. We want to derive those that capability plan and understand how we can deliver that through and and re-engineer our systems or retire our systems or upgrade our systems. And Secretary uh, talks um, that last line. I like to I like to talk about with my staff a lot. We'll prioritize speed of delivery, continuous adaptation, and frequent modular upgrades. How I mean, as a geek, right? I mean, if we want to really, as a as an cozy professional, right? How cool is it that the Secretary of Defense of the United States is talking about modular modular open systems, essentially, right? So we've got a working group for that, and we can we can we can all uh, you know this this so it matters. DoD systems engineering is uh, is critical. One of the things, um, uh, back to the Secretary's uh, third priority, is to really reform the department's business um, 
in order to be more economic efficient and carry out the defense strategy. And many of you know we're going through a little bit of a reorganization in the DOD. We've broken up our, our, uh, our acquisition uh, team. We were formerly under a single undersecretary for acquisition, technology, and logistics. And for my partners in, in government, we understand, and, and for all of you, we know the full life cycle and the A, T, and L had elements of that entire full life cycle. And the focus of the acquisition, technology, and logistics organization, that undersecretary, was on that whole life cycle and how do I get systems right? How do I evolve them, apply systems engineering rigor, testing and evaluation and delivery, production and fielding of those systems. And our focus was all about that. We were all about getting those systems through that pipeline and out comes a capability at the end, a system that we can field and operate and maintain. Well, we are splitting up that, that undersecretariat into two. We now have a new undersecretariat for acquisition and sustainment. It's going to watch over those programs and the sustainment of those programs, but we, are, we have created, as part of this administration, a new undersecretary for research and engineering. It gives, it raises up the level of visibility of technology and engineering capability and competency and the importance of that for the Department of Defense. It, is a, uh, it, it has a directed focus on prototyping, experimentation, innovation, capture, technology, development, but more so, another quote from, uh, from our secretary, is to not only just develop and focus on developing those new technologies, success is it goes to those who have an ability to integrate technology faster, more rapidly, more repeatedly into our, uh, into our systems. And so this new undersecretariat for research and engineering, the focus there is going to be on that. How can we shift the culture, the mindset, the focus, the mission on this new and innovation and really take this technology, this, this sixth contested area of technology and really focus on it as part of our national defense strategy. From an engineering perspective, my, uh, my organization, uh, my mission, we've, we've resolved ourselves as a community in uh, DOD uh, around a number of DOD systems engineering goals. I work these very closely with my uh, military departments, our Army, Air Force, uh, and, uh, and Navy, and as well as my interagency uh, agency partners within the DOD and uh, with across the federal government. Um, we all recognize the need to grow and maintain our technical talent, technical and technical leadership talent. Uh, we come here for a lot of these types of, um, of discussions. We're very excited to use your competency model and partner with that. Um, we provide, as part of the function of my office, uh, uh, mission support, program support. We identify, we help programs, we support programs to identify technical risk and think about um, uh, uh, how to manage that risk. Uh, which isn't just watch it, which isn't just develop your risk registers and your red, yellow, green cube, but rather understand what are the impacts of that, how can I avoid those impacts, if I think they're going to occur, what are my off-ramps and how am I going to recover. Most importantly, how am I going to make sure that I have the right amount of resources to address those risks. We want to continue to provide that quality support across the department's acquisition community to make sure that engineering and technical risk and technology risk and manufacturing risk and production transition risk is all factored into the decisions and investments that we make on a daily basis. We seek, as you all do, as we all do, to mature our engineering practices, to, to, to find ways to implement modularity, open um, architect, open, open systems approaches uh, to, to allow that refresh. Uh, and innovation to allow cost savings to even have the uh, capability to be, be more sustainable. Uh, we see modular open systems approaches as a primary uh, requirement for systems. In fact, our Congress 
uh, two years ago now, I believe, legislated that all systems that are invested in by the Department of Defense, all programs, will be modular and open to the maximum extent practicable. So we need help. We need to make sure that our programs have a way to, us to evaluate that edict. How can I certify that I am open to the maximum extent practical? We did a little survey a couple years ago after that law was written, and we did a survey of all the programs, and we said, tell us if you're modular and open. And guess, <laughs> guess what they said? Yeah, 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 we are, we are. They all were, they all are. Okay, check, right? So we can do better. We can do better. We want to make sure we can measure the, the, the benefits of, of being open, that we can measure, that we can, we can think about how, how, how do we achieve those standards, uh, and we want to share those best practices and proliferate them. The fourth bullet, uh, digital uh, engineering and digital uh, acquisition. Um, we are migrating to that. We published a DOD strategy. I'll talk about that on the next, uh, on the next slide. Software. Software continues to be a critical element of our systems, as I mentioned. Our Defense Science Board just recently released a software um, acquisition practices uh, report. We will be um, very, very focused on implementing or, or on developing an implementation strategy to address some of the recommendations. There's also another uh, uh, Defense uh, Innovation Board um, study right now on software practices. So it's a very much on the, on the minds of the leadership of the department. Um, how can we make sure that we've got the right talent, the right practices, that we are incentivizing the right kinds of processes um, with, our, with our supply chain? And um, and uh, you know taking a look at, at developing the next set of techniques. But from this community, I, I get once again you know this this integration of software and the, and systems. And uh, so I, I do think that that's a that's a real good opportunity to continue to work together, uh, so that we can we can evolve that that uh, that practice. Um, Cyber resilient weapon systems. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit further about. I've just I've picked a couple slides after this slide just to kind of highlight a few a few key things to to leave you with that are that are really critical to um, uh, and priorities for us. And one of those is how do we how do we fundamentally design our systems with with cyber with security as an attribute. Uh, one of the first places that I went to in order to start having this discussion was in Cozy. We, uh, we established, and Rick Dove, I don't know if Rick is still here in the audience, but Rick was a partner in this, in this uh, concern, and we established a working group, and so your systems and software engineering working group has been, I'm, I'm sorry, your, your system security engineering working group has been really, really a terrific way to have a conversation with this community and get this community to start recognizing that security is a fundamental uh, system security engineering is a fundamental s discipline of systems engineering and start building out that method and practice to be able to allow us to employ it. So that's really important. Um, trusted uh, 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 hardware and software is a, is a, uh, is a critical um, goal for, for our, our uh, department. And um, taking what we have done together to uh, I to, do to define system of systems engineering principles, practices, methods, applications, competencies, and apply them towards that mission engineering uh, context. Apply our system of systems principles to achieve a mission outcome. And what we seek to do is, is raise the level of visibility of, of not just engineering on our programs, but understanding how our programs contribute cap to mission capabilities. So that's a, that's a, uh, a goal of ours, and that's how we uh, align our, our activities. So a couple, just a couple slides on some of those goals. Our digital engineering strategy, uh, we had a couple copies here. We had brochures here at the conference. Uh, I'm thrilled about this, um, and it wasn't just DOD alone. This was a wonderful collaboration and partnership with many of, with Incozy and many of the organizations that are, that are in this room. Uh, uh, thank you all. I think um, what we did is we just wanted to put a target out there. We wanted to we wanted to sh talk about digital engineering as part of our engineering transformation. This, is, this puts a target out that our community in the DOD can really wake up and, and take notice. 
digital engineering is not just about the engineering community, but the engineering community is really sort of a, a catalyst, an enabler. It's our practices that we can, we can s begin to demonstrate. And we believe that through this, through, de through employing model-based engineering and model and digital practices, we can demonstrate these capabilities and then they can evolve to sustainment communities, product lifecycle management, to acquisition, to, our, to the way in which we contract, the way in which we have an agreement between the customer and the supplier. We can move away from a document-based uh, organization and process and exchange data. We can have a better relationship perhaps with our, with our warfighters, with our users who are trying to describe their needs. They know that they have a gap, they have a concept of operations. We are the employers of solutions to those gaps. We are the, I, we are the, th we are the ones that think up opportunities to maybe employ systems in a, di in a slightly different fashion or mature a technology that can really be a game changer having those discussions instead of writing them down about what my technology might do or my warfighter might have what the problems that that, that that community has, writing them down can now transition to a model or a simulation to have a much better, uh, more integrated discussion about the, about, about the capability needs and the solution ops that are, that are there. So our next steps, we're working uh, with, our, with our, our three services as well as several agencies. We're also sharing with our inner agencies and with, with uh, the constituents here um, to put together some implementation plans. But for this, for this audience, we have some, we have some challenges uh, on the way ahead. And so as you, uh, thanks to Troy and others who established the digital um, artifacts uh, activity and the model-based uh, systems engineering activity that Incozi continues to spearhead and champion. There's some there's some challenges that we can all you know start to start to work together on. So I, I leave those uh, for you to to help us you know think about so that we can make this a, a reality, become more than just a strategy, but actually deliver this capability, change the business. Human capital, as I mentioned before, number one priority. Um, it's really critical for us to think about as we as we as we've talked about, you know, the paradigm shift and changing to this, you know, contested technology uh, uh, environment, adopting new and non-traditional defense capabilities and technologies into our systems. That has an impact on our on our human capital. So we're very very concerned and very um, uh, seeking to identify what is the next set of what's what's our current. How can we mature our current um, human capital to augment them with the latest in technology and how can we develop our future human capital in the critical tech areas, technology areas that we, that we need. So we see this technical edge opportunity, whether they be new and emerging technologies, techniques and the way that you might employ a system or, d or, or, or or manufacture a system or approaches uh, to all of that, the engineer is the one that, uh, that creates and adapts our systems in order to deliver that capability differential. So we're working to identify what those emerging technologies are. We've, we've issued a number of studies. Um, I know uh, several of, of uh, our Incozi partners have done the same. Um, our goal is to assess whether DOD has the right expertise today, identify where those gaps are, and then find ways to educate and train, maintain, and attract new talent uh, towards the department. Um, one example of this, I just highlight um, something that uh, our Air Force partners did. Um, our, they, they just, this is just a sampling of like the breadth of technical competencies that, um, that the Department of Defense employs. And this would be different uh, uh, for Air Force as it is for Navy, as it is for Army. And so in the position that I'm in, what we try to do is we pull together, and in fact next week we're gonna have a, 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 a uh, organic engineering workforce meeting where we can we can collectively say um, where where are the key challenges in your workforce what are those cross-cutting areas that we all need that are not unique to a certain uh, an engineering center and then collectively we'd like to um, work together to build out those competencies and start um, a, a building the programs to to um, to either 
train our current workforce or attract the, the future workforce. So a couple common areas that we've already identified is this uh, cybersecurity engineering. Cybersecurity, very much an IT, you know, started, you know, really an IT field. Um, it turns out it's not. It's absolutely a responsibility of, of um, our entire, it's a systems problem, cybersecurity. And uh, we find that uh, as we engineer our systems to be re vul re resilient to, to, cyber s to cyber vulnerabilities, we need cybersecurity engineers that understand systems. We need systems cybersecurity engineers. And so that's just a, uh, an example of a common and cross-cutting need that we are focused on. Uh, others are model-based engineering. Uh, we need to be able to train our, our engineering core to, um, to be able to employ these tools, to be able to, to um, engage with our, with our supply chain uh, using these tools, uh, software engineering, um, and then other uh, unique technical uh, capabilities. So we look really forward to um, using the Encozy uh, competency model um, as, we, as we move forward on this challenge of really measuring the health and status uh, of our engineering uh, our organic engineering workforce. Now, a little bit more on, uh, on, on future talent. We have a program that we started a number of years ago. It's probably been about 10 years now. We started a systems engineering capstone marketplace. Uh, this was, this was a, f a program that's been operated by our systems engineering research center. And the whole idea, on the right side, I have sort of uh, stakeholders of our community and then the value that a program like this could have to these stakeholders. I think it's a, I think it's a triple win. I think that having, let me describe to you what it is first though. So Capstone Program says that we want to be able to define very interesting product projects for senior design uh, engineers, either systems engineers or or core comp or core engineering, mechanical, civil, electrical uh, engineering curricula. So as part of their as part of their design capstone uh, projects, we want to we want to develop very very cool uh, programs problems to 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 give to those to those um, undergraduates and graduates. What that does then is that that lets them start thinking about, get that, that lets them get to know our needs, our problem space a little bit. We all have a problem in attracting the future talent towards our business area. And so we are very interested in engaging with these future, with this future human capital talent and, and shifting their focus towards our problems. So a win for us is we're starting to shift their focus and get them introduced to us. A win for them, another win for us is we get innovation, innovative solutions to problems that we are, we're facing. And a win for them, we believe, is that these students will now graduate if we do this right. And the way that we're doing this capstone program is it's not just a, a challenging problem, it's a problem space that, that is puts into the, into the, uh, the capstone de design solution activity a systems approach. So we're, we're teaching these students that are either in, their, in our core engineering uh, disciplines, systems thinking. So the win for the students is as they graduate and they begin to employ the practices that they've studied so hard to learn uh, and, and, apply and, and begin to apply what they've, what they've d gotten their degree in, they can come out in the world and be ready to go from a systems perspective. They know they would understand that much more how, how their talent and their particular uh, discipline can be employed to achieve uh, this enterprise and, and larger system benefit. So it's a triple win. Students gain systems experience, govern, government and industry uh, attract talent, and we get innovative solutions to our problems. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm pointing this out here because I think it's a real opportunity for us as a community, for the INCOSI, uh and for our industry associations. I think that what we should do is create a repository of these very cool uh, engineering systems problems, and I think that we should find a way to collect these, these uh, capstone design ideas 
into some sort of repository and then create a network, a, a matching, you know? So if I've got universities that have capstone design needs, which I know you all have them, we, we want to be an offering of here's some really pretty cool systems related engineering challenge capstone design problems that you can have. We can create this matching capability. We can link these students with some mentors and we don't have to overwhelm ourselves, it, but we can, we can start creating that matching. But this might be something really cool for us as a community to, to grow. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to grow the numbers of systems engineers in our, in, in, in our community. We're trying to promote, this is what Gary said, start your own engineering student chapter, your own cozy chapters on your university campuses. This is really maybe a good, a good way to, 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 to achieve those, that vision and that goal. So I wanted to share that to you. Uh, cybersecurity, uh, as I mentioned, it's sort of, you know, it's everybody's problem. Um, it doesn't matter if you're in the Department of Defense or if you're in industry or if you're in academia or if you're at your own home personal computer and you're worried about your, your finances or your personal information or your family. We all worry about cybersecurity. And so in the Department of Defense, we made it not just an IT or a CIO problem. We publish policy for the acquisition system that says that it's the responsibility of the program. It's a systems problem. And from a cybersecurity vulnerability perspective, your our program manager, our programs are responsible for programs, their systems, and their information, and the vulnerability of all to a cyber threat. The cyber threat includes the information about the systems that you're, that you're developing or designing, the information that's residing on your networks or on your company's networks or on your supplier's networks. It's about the, the security of your organizations and your personnel from insiders or those who wish to, uh, to exploit the information uh, that, you're, that you're developing, that intellectual property, if you will. The, the networks that employ, that, that connect your systems as you develop them and, and contain the, mis the, the information in your development environments and your testing environments. And those supporting the systems of the system of interest itself that you're developing, how can you make sure that it is resilient to uh, uh, a, a cyber uh, uh, attack? Um, and the supporting systems, our testing, our maintenance systems, our, our uh, manufacturing capabilities, our logistics support systems. So we have integrated cybersecurity or security as a feature, as an attribute across our acquisition system. And I fundamentally believe it's a system security engineering uh, uh, discipline that can, that can help us to achieve these goals and mitigate and understand these vulnerabilities and, uh, and mitigate these risks. I'm going to give you a little bit of a comparison about the current state of play in the federal government. Right now, we have, we have uh, put in uh, executive order, and it is the federal approach to cybersecurity to employ a risk management framework. Many of you in this room may be familiar with the NIST standards. Uh, 853 and 800-171. There's a number of NIST standards that employ risk management framework. It is absolutely awesome that we're treating cyber as a risk and we're employing good risk management practices. However, what happens today when we employ those standards, the risk management framework is a set of baseline security controls, things that you should do, techniques, patterns, uh, 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 th tools that you employ. It's a set of security controls. And our programs today, whether you're a network or a system or something or a, or a simulation, are asked, are, are required to, to employ these security controls. Well, on the left-hand side, we're very familiar with this strategy. I have a requirement. Maybe that requirement is to be secure, right? And what I do with that requirement, I understand that requirement, I think about how I'm going to employ that requirement inside my system, and as part of my system design, I derive that requirement into my system spec, I, do, I derive that into my different components uh, and into the baselines that I'm developing, I implement that requirement into the design, I understand its traceability throughout, I can measure it, I can validate that I met the requirement, I can verify that I met the requirement, and then I can come back and I can validate that my system is operating with 
uh, with, that with that requirement implemented. From a security control perspective and the m risk management framework, it's done in an entirely separate and parallel way, and it's done by taking the book of security controls, tailoring them perhaps to a domain or a, a system type or a, or a network. I may have an overlay that I, uh, that I employ. And so I, get a, I, I basically reduce the big set of controls to a, a lesser set of controls, and then those get approved through some by, by a security control uh, authorizing official, official and then um, uh, added to the uh, program system uh, design requirement. That's all done separate and parallel, and the problem that we have is there's no validation, there's no derivation, there's no trades inside the design space. It's not employed as part of the system. It is, it is there's, there's no verification. Uh, and so this is the situation that we have right now, and this is something that, I'd, that we seek to, um, to uh, overcome. What we want to do is merge these important security controls and the RMF process and framework along with and into the systems engineering process. We believe that we can do that by making system security engineering a recognized you know, uh, discipline that's employed in a regular uh, basis. And we think that the methods uh, that we can develop as engineers uh, can, can be used to achieve uh, those security control features and requirements um, that, are, that are mandated by these, by these standards. So we still have work to do in this space. Um, it's a challenge for our systems. It's a challenge for our industrial base partners. And at the end of the day, it's a challenge to the mission because the systems are, are potentially still vulnerable. And my last slide, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, uh, applying our systems engineering research. The, this year, we're going to have our 10th anniversary of the Systems Engineering Research Center. I'm very proud of that, and I'm very pleased that members of the CERC um, have really integrated with the INCOSI community. And in that 10 years, I think that we've made incredible new partnerships internationally. We have, um, we have fleshed out a research agenda. Um, and uh, however, the challenge is, I'm not sure we've really solved all the challenges that drove our research agenda. Um, and so I, I would like to just leave the research community and the transition uh, community that I have here in this room today with some opportunities for focus uh, for all of us, because we talk a lot about a paradigm shift and transforming engineering practice, but I'm not sure that we're there yet, and I think that we have more to do. And so I think that we should challenge ourselves to transition the modularity uh, principles that we talked about. We all talked about how it's going to be beneficial. Um, we want to we want to transition our advanced digital engineering um, practices, our tools, our artifacts. Uh, start employing them in the environments that we uh, we operate. Uh, on a daily basis, start employing them with our business processes, our technical processes, uh, in order to really rapidly and genera generate or refresh those capabilities that we're all trying to deliver, capabilities or services, whatever it is. So I challenge us to do that transition of those tools to really transform the state of the practice. I also challenge us all to demonstrate some of those system security engineering methods and how they can really uh, deliver uh, solutions to those uh, security controls that are that are required, or disregard the you know regardless of the security controls. How can we make sure that we're delivering systems that are resilient? And then finally, I want to challenge us all to continue to evaluate invest in uh, changes to our classic systems engineering assumptions and practices and approaches so that we can incorporate and manage technologies like artificial intelligence as part of our systems. Machine learning and our into our complex uh, man-machine systems. There's a lot of, of focus on artificial intelligence in all sectors. It's a number one buzzword, right? How many times did we say artificial intelligence this week, right? A lot. It's talked about a lot. And in our community, I think the real key challenge is not just 
let's go out and hire some artificial intelligence uh, software developers or, s or technologists or create an artificial intelligence center. Let's, what the challenge, true challenge is, as you know, is how do you, is designing your systems and allocating that, that, c that capability in your systems, understanding the distribution of the c functions to the human or, the, or to the system itself evaluating and, and being able to ensure that, uh, have assurance that as the system learns or changes or adapts, that it's still safe, secure. Uh, understanding how to test that system. How do we do that validation? You know all of, I'm speaking to the choir on this, so I think that our third key challenge is, is really think about how do we change our classic systems engineering approach to really adopt this new technology because it's here already, it's in use, and it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us. Um, as engineers, we really need to uh, think through how we're going to be able to deliver confidently and with assurance new system f capabilities that uh, leverage this amazing technology. And so with that, uh, that concludes my formal set of remarks. I'd be more than happy to take s any questions uh, as time permits. Um, and I thank you very much for having me here. Thank you.